Okay, welcome to the CNET stage here at CES 2017. This is CES In-Depth on day one of the show. This is the formal opening of the day. I'm Brian Cooley, Dr. Scott Stein here as usual to monitor my condition in case there are any health emergencies. He's ready to jump in the breach. So make, sure, make sure the show continues on. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry, PhD comes next year. We're here to talk about the biggest trends at the show so far. That's what you'd imagine from a best of CES show. Now, first up, Scott, we're going to talk about adorable robots like Curie. Uh, there's a whole, been a whole rise of little robots here that I, until this show, thought were the stupidest thing on earth. And then I got a look at Curie, and I'm smitten. It is adorable. And that's what they're trying to do. <laughs> that's they're trying all to, they're trying to do. Damn it, they're trying to win us over. And they Artificial are. Artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, that, that is a trend. Adorable robots. Padded robots, cute robots, oogly, oogly cuddly, beeping robots. And Curry is a surveillance robot. This should creep us out, right? But yeah. it is actually really uh, cute, it's engaging, and that's the great victory here. We were talking about this yesterday, computer vision, artificial intelligence, those have been advancing really rapidly. Yeah. And so these robots move in the same way as before, but they're doing many much more they're powerful so things. They're so much more smart and intuitive yeah. because of that, like you said, the democratization of machine learning and computer vision, and the fact that they are going first at the adorability factor, which sounds ridiculous, but I think it is absolutely the way you sell not just the category, but your specific entry in it because I believe the functions of these robots will all be commodity. They'll all do about the same thing. Just like our phones, yep. just like our televisions, just like everything else. But who's going to win in the end is the one that I, and this is crazy to say, the one that I have a relationship with. And there's a stealth thing going on here. We use Amazon Echo, we talk to things, but they're, they're hitting a wall. So maybe things like this are exploring how those devices will start engaging next. Yeah. They might yeah. start developing ways to try to get our attention feel like they're responding to us more, so we don't feel like we hit that, oh, I don't understand you, I can't respond to that query. Happens to me all the time on any voice device. What's well, interesting about Curie, though, people look at this when we're talking about Echo and Alexa and all that, is Curie doesn't talk. Curie can hear you, but Curie only communicates with facial expressions, head turns, and little R2-D2-like beeps and blurps. See, yeah, I want that, that, that head sitting on top of an Amazon Echo. I want like yeah. the little robot head, so if it doesn't know, it can turn its head to the side. I do want the power of Alexa in this thing. It'll probably be announced any day now, right? I mean, right. <laughs> if yeah. not, they're insane. It, it's out there. But I don't, you, you and I were talking yesterday, I'm not sure I want it to try too hard to be specifically human, and maybe really good voice, and I can't believe I'm saying this, maybe really good voice is a bridge too far, that it can, it'll lose its specialness, because in a year from now, everything's going to be talking to us in natural language. That's going to go commodity too. Right, and it makes sense for some things not to talk because if you have one thing you're talking to in your home, we already probably have this now in our homes, you talk to something and then more than one thing responds. Right, and then that what, day's coming. Yeah, and it's like already kind of happening and so you can't have that and, and one company's not going to win your home unless you become like, yeah. you, I mean, I don't think so. I think you'll still have some device that doesn't connect so you got to have some be silent and right. be responsive in other ways. Right. It's like kids in a household. Uh, be believe me, you, you think we're nuts, I don't blame you, but when you get a chance to uh, check this little robot out, I yeah. think it's the leader in the category. It's uh, $699, Mayfield Robotics is bringing it out. They're taking pre-orders, now you do a $100 deposit, like a, like a very affordable Tesla. And they don't deliver until a year from now, which if it slips, we're into 18. So this is down the road a ways, but I got to say, I was taken and I don't like robots. So this impressed me. <laughs> this is the CES of the robot. Right. This is, this this is, is what it we'll, is. We'll look back years from now. <laughs> Sitting there, having a cool, refreshing cocktail and a smoke. When served to us by robots. But served by robots. And say, remember, remember 17, that damn robot year? And we'll be taking it to a robot. <laughs> is that, <laughs> right. Do you remember that? I do not remember <laughs> that. No. I'm smiling, or, a or cute robot. Or in language, boop, 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 boop. Yeah. Yeah. Blizzing. All right. Kiri was cute. Cute as a cute as a button. Uh, LG OLED W. You're as in love with this thing as I am, right? Yeah, and I actually went and go check. Uh, I checked it out, and it's amazing. I took a it's picture crazy. of it. People couldn't believe how thin it was, and it just shows TVs can be damn cool it's still. And you know, sure, do you need a thin TV? Do you need a big TV like that? That's that thin, but it, it is amazing yes. to look at. I need a thin TV more than I need a 140 inch TV, which we normally see here. Yeah. I don't think I heard anybody roll out a TV that is the new world's biggest. No one. No. For the true. first time in I think 
10 years, I have not heard that here. Instead, I saw world's thinnest, and that makes so much more sense to me than a TV that I literally can't get through a standard eight-foot door in an average home. I love the idea of applying it like wallpaper, I or you know, it. if you could eventually just do, but put these up easily, that's the other thing is mounting them easily. 18 pounds is nothing yeah. and then for, you, for a big TV. You don't TV. need to hire someone. And, um, and as we notice, we're looking at the video now, it has a sound bar that is more than a sound bar, that is also the breakout box, if you will, where a thin, flat ribbon comes off this very thin tenth of an inch screen, goes to that sound bar, and on the sound bar you see right there are all your ports for HDMI, USB, uh, your audio connections, and power as well. So the power goes up through a flat ribbon. Nothing spoils the, the, uh, the illusion of floating, except for a very flat ribbon cable that you're, you know, you're, maybe you're going to run it if you want to be ambitious, or just put that thing down with some double sticky tape and paint it. I'm sure that's sacrilege in, in LG world. That's what I would do. I got a roller. I'll paint that damn thing. Yeah, put some like scotch double stick behind it. I'm done. Why is there more wire hiding paint? <laughs> Special right. really textured, thick. Really yeah, thick. stucco. The return <laughs> it's, right. of the... it's, it's like putty. <laughs> just put it on like that. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> okay. Now, you got to explain this one to me. Uh, the Razer laptop that came out that supports multiple high-performance monitors. I get it, but I don't get it. Right, it's the classic CES laptop. This is the, this is the computer, those concept ones that keep appearing, and it's the most absurd or the coolest thing you've seen. We're looking at it now, uh, there it Razor is. Razer loves doing this. Razer is the king of, of CES showstopper ideas. Now my question, my question, this is a yes. single three-panel articulated monitor, not three monitors all stuck, standing right. on their own stands. So the, yeah, they, they pull out. Okay, it's a makeup mirror. Yeah, got it. A, a pull out, make, make your own crazy makeup Open, mirror fold of magic screens. Okay. And there was a laptop in the past that did something like this with a second uh, display, but not okay. this big. And, and, you know, Dan Ackerman showing this right now. There are games that take advantage of multiple monitors, sure. tons of them. Yeah. And, you know, you have immersive VR headsets. There are reasons to connect monitors and screens. You don't need them all in one laptop, though. You could set them up yourself. Um, I way more get it now that I'm seeing the packaging. This is a great industrial design exercise where these yes. all unfold from a thick lid and go out. I thought it was just three monitors that kind of were all cabling individually to right. a laptop. No, all, I thought all you were out containers. of your mind. No, <laughs> and at the right price, a lot of people would go for that. That's very slick industrial design. It's cool, and if you start developing screens that bend more in the future, maybe a future screen tech yeah. would start going places. And then curved screens make sense, because curved screens don't make sense for groups, they don't make sense for the family TV, but they do make sense for the individual user who's positioned properly, for immersion right. at the just the right arm's length. And now, you have to wonder if that competes with VR. It's not as Absolutely. immersive, but close. Yeah, I agree. And I think for gamers, there's a real question of if your game looks really great at high resolution, do you want to put something on in VR that right now is a lower Dumps resolution, but, but higher immersion? And a lot of people don't like that, and the interfaces are different. You know, a lot of, of first-person games don't port the same way. Of course. So you may want it. I agree. A lot of people might prefer to add the monitors. Okay, that's, that, that's cool. I do get it now. <laughs> I thought, I was, <laughs> thought I was losing my step there Crazy for a minute. Crazy monitor resolution. Now, VR and AR, of course, still advancing here at CES. Uh, not a new topic by any uh, stretch, but uh, Intel tried to kind of make things go eh, and kind of kick it a little bit with a, uh, a 3D video walkthrough demo of, of a core technology uh, that they've got. You've gotten a look at this, right? This I haven't seen yet. Okay, <laughs> let's, we have a video, I think, All of the that. lucky people at the press conference did yesterday. Uh, That's what, this was the press conference where the media that attended yeah. actually had VR headsets on as Intel showed off uh, what is a, I guess what you'd call it is a highly movable placement of you in the scene. You can go anywhere at any time. Yeah, this is a knitting together of, of, of a video into a 3D, I think they were calling it a volumetric kind of render. Um, it, it, it was tremendously high bandwidth. You're not going to be able to create like this at home. It's like three gigabits per second yeah, data rate. Yeah, some crazy Huge. amount. And, but the idea is that you could walk around in a 3D video or feel like that. Yeah. I mean, the effect is somewhere between, you know, it looks like somewhere between like video game and video, but, but, but feeling like a real video. But you can see there, it kind of yeah. ha has a little bit of a Skyrim feel, you know, like, a, like, like it's a video, but or it's Witcher 4. Um, so I'll, say, I'll say this, this kind of thing is, if you're going to do VR, that's really the gold standard we have to work toward, is giving me the ability not to be fixed in place, not to hop between selectable locations. I need to be able to move through this thing as if it's in the world. Yeah. And for capturing, I mean, the fantasy of capturing your memories or, or some sort of place you've been and be able to walk around in it later. Yeah. Sure, and I think everyone's trying to strive to come up with a new idea in VR. All the big players in VR, a lot of them are, are taking the show off. Uh, Oculus Rift, PlayStation VR. Um, VR's run into a use case wall. It the has. hardware and the technologies there, the use cases, despite a lot of good minds in, in various communities, haven't found that, I don't think yet, they haven't found their Pokemon. 
Well, and everyone I know, uh, not everyone I know, a lot of people I know who use VR, myself included, uh, it, despite how amazed they are by it, even if they own it, uh, don't return to it quite as often as they yeah, think. That's uh, because it's a huge commitment. Yeah. And that, you gotta overcome that, maybe it's smaller devices, and you have Qualcomm, Intel, and other players in the market now all wanting to get involved too. And you can see a lot of people throwing things against a wall, trying to, mm -hmm. and then incorporating augmented reality, which is, is even more not there yet. Yeah, that's but our has mixed potential. reality conversation where we're seeing a lot of players say, wait a minute, let's give you some of the um, very photorealistic uh, imported objects and people that we bring in from the VR world, yeah. but you're still seeing them placed in your real world, and as you turn your head, they don't move, because they're placed in the scene, not placed in your vision, which is a very important psychological difference. And then if you want to get really get tripped out by it, there's another way it works. Merged reality or mixed reality, Intel calls it merged. There's another way it does it. Project Alloy and a couple of others capture stuff in the real world, scan it, and then put it into VR. That's called mixed reality too. But it doesn't okay. look like things are in the real world, it does the opposite. So you're in VR, but it also knows where your table is, or your, your friend is in there. Huh. And why do you use that? And well, they, that's what people are trying to figure out. And they wonder why consumers are bewildered by <laughs> AR yeah. and VR. And now we're going to introduce them to mixed reality. There's a lot of time that they oh need boy. to this All right, let's go to the vomitorium, as I call it. Um, some companies uh, showing off VR, doing it, saying, hey, come stand here, put on our VR headset, we're going to blow you away, and they typically do, but Samsung went to the point of putting you in any number of almost like Victorian torture devices, and then strapping on VR. Here's BT. Is this okay, BT in there? Yeah. Close my eyes. <laughs> we're holding on tight. This, we're chilling. We're chilling. Two. We're going to launch. Okay. All right. Here we go. We're going down this track. We're going to launch, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in space right now. Oh, this is tight. There's about, there's large ships that are kind of like Star Destroyers. And we got some, oh, dude. <laughs> oh, okay. We're going through these like little tunnel targets. Ah, oh, shh. No, okay, okay. <laughs> more tunnels, more spaceships. Okay, we're doing these twisty things. Uh-oh, this is some blue tunnel. Ah, damn. Ah! Hyperspace. Oh, ah! Okay. There's like asteroids and more spaceships and air's blowing in my face. I haven't wet myself yet. I'm still holding on to my lunch. Oh! Oh, oh. Okay, now I'm going through these like crystals. Oh, sh I'm getting rocked. Stay on target, stay on target, stay on. Right. Shot, red one. So, okay, lava clearly. More. <laughs> more tunnels, more spaceships. Stay that's on my, target, that's stay good. on target. <laughs> I gotta try that out now. Famous last words, if boom. You, if you can't win people over with VR, make them If that sick. doesn't do it, yeah. forget it. Forget it, that's, that's it. They put everything they could behind it. Anyway, uh, nothing new in the technology, but no. something you may have never seen in terms of the lengths the technology companies will go to put you through an experience here and sell the concept. There's a little thing going on here that I think is, is, is hint, it's hinting at too. Exactly, no new tech, it's Gear VR, but they're striving for a theme, tar, theme park type experience. Probably no accident because you don't have to buy the tech necessarily and you only use it for a short period of time. And yeah. you can sense there's a theme parkization feeling of arcade, theme yeah. park, test it, don't buy it. And so I think companies are actually trying to figure that out. And that maps to the, the thing we were just talking about. A lot of people even own VR early on or still, they basically sample it. There's not a frequent use case. Yeah. And so they may be the first ones that discover, you know what, this belongs like, I think, 3D printers in the hands of vendors and service companies not in every kitchen counter in, in, in the world. I'm glad Samsung wasn't trying to sell us in a giant gyroscopic spinner for our living room. <laughs> no. Family hub gyroscope. That would be, that we would oh, go for imagine? a ride in. Yeah, dead serious. <laughs> Tong no tongue in cheek, it's like absolutely, every home it's should have 2018. this. 2018. Why wouldn't you want this? Yeah, it's coming, Alexa powered. Oh yeah, of course. All right, yeah. I think we wrap up now with a concept car, a little automotive here from uh, Bosch, a big supplier of tech to many of the world's automakers that has haptic touch, uh, gestures, that's not all entirely new, but also facial recognition, your phone as a key. They kind of took all the, the greatest hits of what's coming soon in cars and rolled it into one concept of how we might deal with vehicles in the future. So here it is, I mean, we're clearly looking at a concept car, nothing about this is remotely realistic. But if you look at the idea of haptic facial recognition, um, also voice recognition is being talked about in the industry. 
A lot of this, frankly, is almost a, and this is Toyota's concept, that it has yeah. something similar called UE. Uh, car companies right now are trying to figure out, we need to have a, uh, have a new relationship between you and the car as they start to become autonomous. We're not going to just leave you to twiddle your thumbs. We still want to be engaged with you as a brand, even though we're not doing so by making you drive. But we still want to be involved with you. Otherwise, why are we doing this? They don't really care about autonomy unless it leads to them having a more and different relationship with the driver. Because they're in this to sell cars or services or something, not to give you a self-driving car and say, go do what you want with it. Yeah, it's finding ways to make it work, to make it, I keep thinking about what Toyota was talking about, about making, uh, engaging with the driver and developing a relationship that makes sense, responsiveness. Yeah, yeah and a lot of that was about that, um, was it decrement of vigilance they talked about? That's that, a great phrase, I, I like said, that. He said it, was, it was a seminal study in the 40s, uh, Gil Pratt said that uh, they noticed that radar operators on warships back in World War II, no matter how intrigued they were about making sure that they didn't have an attack coming, you eventually lose interest, your mind wanders. You may be staring at the radar still, and you stop seeing things, because your eyes are bored, I guess is the simple way to put it. So car makers and Bosch here, Toyota as well, are starting to talk about how do we get cars to have a, I guess a holding on loosely relationship with you. They're not totally going to have your attention because they're going to let you stop driving, still moving down the road, but they want to keep you vaguely and lightly engaged, like a little tap once in a while to say, hey, remember, we're still, we're still doing this together. I just had a thought that goes back to the beginning. What if we go full circle? What if those cute, ro could those cute robots end up in our cars? I want Curie to drive me out of here right now. Yeah, like an adorable car interface. Right. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go in our cute cars. And Curie, and, 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 then, and then the greatest heartbreaker of all time when you realize that, that you know, Curie knows the F word when she has her first road rage moment. It's like, come on, Curie. I thought you were a darling little thing. All right, that's it for CES In Depth for this first day of CES 2017. Myself, Scott Stein, we're back here. I think both of us are back here tomorrow, right? Yeah. Okay, we're back on same the deck time. tomorrow. Same back time and channel and all that, and that'll be tomorrow. Uh, and we'll see you when programming starts again at the CNET stage at 9 a.m. Pacific tomorrow. Until then, enjoy the show if you're still here. Have a good evening. We'll see you again tomorrow on CNET.